So I thank all of you for having joined us today, uh, today evening, uh, where we have a very interesting session. We have with us Professor Mahfoot, who's going to uh, give, a, give us a very useful insights into this subject. So before we go on to his talk, I would just uh, give a brief introduction to, uh, to PCOS by discussing some aspects like uh, the, 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 the challenges that we have often in terms of diagnosing PCOS and also the different phenotypes that exist because of the fact that we... Sorry, sir, use, full screen, please. Uh, yeah, uh, because of the different phenotypes that we use for, uh, for the, I mean, for the, because of the different diagnostic criteria that we use for diagnosis of PCOS. So based on this, we have different phenotypes existing. So I'll just give a brief introduction to this. And I'm sure uh, Professor Makhfoud is going to uh, discuss uh, uh, many more aspects which we will finally uh, be learning from him. So we know that uh, this is a very common uh, common condition, which is uh, the prevalence of which is today ranging from uh, anywhere between six to twenty percent, depending on uh, what population we are looking at. And uh, this was first described, uh, as we all know, in uh, way back in 1935 by Steen and Leventhal. And then there has been a lot of confusion because of the fact that this is a very heterogeneous disorder, and uh, Hence, they, although we have learned a lot of things, still we need to understand more and more about this uh, disorder. And therefore, they, we hear, uh, we get new and new information every year uh, on this on this disorder. So, if you look at the name itself, the PCOS. I mean, we earlier used to call it as a disorder, but now we understood that it's rather a syndrome rather than rather than a disorder. But even even the current name that we are, we are calling it as polycystic uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. The polycystic appearance of the ovaries frequently is found in patients with PCOS. is caused by accumulation of ovarian follicles, follicles in different stages of matur uh, maturation and or atresia. And the ovarian follicles are basically aggregates, acellular aggregates that contain a single oocyte and are basically not cysts. So therefore, the name itself is a or a misnomer in that in that sense. Now there have been several different uh, names given to this condition, and uh, we have uh, functional ovarian hyperandrogenism. It can be described as that, or you could describe it as a cardiometabolic ovarian syndrome. So there are different aspects because there are different aspects to its heterogeneity in this disorder. Uh, different names have been proposed at different times, and no wonder that we have a significant. Uh, uh, Compl I mean, a difficulty in diagnosis because it's basically diagnosis exclusion. We don't have any specific feature which helps in saying that this is uh, the diagnostic feature of PCOS. There is clinical heterogeneity. There, is, there are different criteria uh, based on the highly variable parameters. There's no laboratory uh, evidence which is diagnostic of PCOS. And similarly, there's no radiological evidence that is diagnostic of PCOS. Ovarian appearance are not, not pathognomic of PCOS. And uh, insulin resistance, which is which is present in most women with PCOS, is not included in the diagnostic criteria. And the important factor, the important fact that we should always keep in consideration is that we need to exclude all the other, all exclude women with other mim mimickers of PCOS. We have several mimickers of PCOS, right, right from hypothyroidism to hyperprolactinemia to a, to a uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So we may uh, late onset. CH. So all these need to be excluded before we diagnose PCOS. While we have seen that there is a lot of heterogeneity and a lot of uh, new, I mean, a lot of new areas which have to be understood. But we, what we know today is that there are three important components to this: that is, the hyperandrogenism, the chronic and the oligoanovulation, and the polycystic ovarian morphology. So these are the three components which are present in variable degrees. And let me just discuss a little about each of these aspects and and then go on to discuss about the diagnostic criteria so if you look at the hyperandrogenism uh, the clinical aspects and the bio biochemical hyperandrogenemia what we know is that the clinical hyperandrogenism is typically characterized by the presence of thick dark terminal hair on different areas of the, the different androgen dependent areas of the body and also the male pattern of hair loss and, and also the presence of acne. In, in, their, uh, in uh, 
and the and the rarer manifestations could be in the form of virilization which may, may manifest as increased muscle mass deepening of voice or clitoral enlargement but the caveats here are that there is significant as we all know there is significant uh, subjectivity in fg scoring the the modified ferriman galvey scoring probably introduced some amount of objectivity but some subjectivity still remains and uh, the important issues are that uh, some of the areas which are uh, not included in the in the fg scoring and also the fact that even when you have a score which is not sig uh, which denotes uh, insignificant hirsutism still there could be women who have concerns about the unwanted hair growth and this this has to be addressed and this this is often not addressed by the scoring system and acne which is far from being a specific uh, sign of pcs especially amongst adolescents adolescents where a more precise classification of the acne depend based on their type of lesions and the topography etc would probably increase the specificity but this we don't uh, we don't have such a system of classification have similarly alopecia which is often seen uh, should be uh, should meet the diagnostic definition of androgenic alopecia in order to distinguish it from other causes of hair loss that are that are numerous and and they may not be specific for pcs when they are seen in isolation if you look at measuring the androgen levels we see that there are current uh, there are, there are several limitations because the currently available assays widely available assays for plasma androgens have poor sensitivity the more specific assays the lcms based assays are are not easily available to every each one of us in our clinical practice and when you look at the uh, look at overcoming the, the 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 difficulties in measuring the free testosterone levels the free androgen index is often suggested as a, as a commonly uh, as as a uh, measure that can be used more often but however we know that the shbg production in the liver may be artificially increased in situations of hyperinsulinism and this may create a major bias in the definition and recognition of of uh, recognition particular of hyperandrogenism particularly in obesity so the follicle count at ultrasound and the serum amh levels can sometimes be used as direct indirect markers of hyperandrogenism the question as to whether hyperandrogenemia should be a mandatory category is still debated and as you know that uh, uh, that, that we have a a a, a what one I mean the category of whom who may not have hyperandrogenemia but still qualify for the definition of PCOS. When you look at oligoinovulation, we know that we are uh, oligo oligomenorrhea is defined as less than eight episodes of menses in a year with a cycle length of more than thirty-five days. But this definition does not include the subclinical disovulation that may be present in the sense. A woman, there could be women who are having regular cycles by this definition, but still are anovulating. The high, higher frequency, higher the frequency of ovulation, the higher testosterone and serum AMH levels are observed, and and tend to these tend to overlap the values, uh, overlap the values of genuine cases of PCOS. It's therefore recommended, particularly in situations of infertility, to check the serum progesterone levels in two consecutive cycles between. The 24, 20th and 24th day of the cycle uh, in women to to assess ovulation because this could be a, a, a otherwise a factor that could be overlooked. And particularly in, in adolescents, it is uh, all, um, the this, uh, menstrual disturbances are very common in the first two or three years after menarche, and and we need to be careful in this, in, in classifying a logo, a logo in ovulation, and we should look at uh, I mean, defining that when they're less than eight menstrual cycles per year, or if we have, if we witness two cycles which are more than, which are either more than 42 days in a year, or 42 days, or less than 22 days. So, with this definition, then the prevalence of oligoinovulation in that age group drops down to 40, 14%. And this becomes a better predictor of PCOS in native life than when you're using the classical criteria. Now, when you look at the polycystic morphology of the ovaries, this is again, uh, when you looked at uh, the earliest definition in 2003 in the Rototam criteria, uh, the criteria was to see, look for 12 or more fo follicles measuring 2 to 9 
millimeters and uh, an increased ovarian volume of more than 10 uh, centimeter 10 mm but we know that with the availability of better machines better equipment of uh, more than 8 megahertz transducer transducers and the use of uh, trans vaginal sonography uh, this criteria probably is no longer uh, valid because we uh, and the criteria now suggests uh, the presence of more than 25 uh, follicles per ovary uh, and and uh, however this is again undeniable in adolescent girls and perimenopausal women so, so with with the, the recent consensus therefore is to have more than 25 follicles per ovary with the new ultrasound machines and uh, with this when you use this criteria we would see that uh, the asymptomatic PCO morphology comes down to almost about 5%. The other aspects about PCOS, other manifestations of PCOS, like presence of uh, other manifestations and in insulin resistance could be present, acanthosis, nitrogen, skin tags, abdominal obesity, and then infertility, uh, infer the infertility in the which could manifest in different forms, like uh, uh, dif difficulty in conceiving, probably increased frequency of miscarriages, less responsiveness to ovulation induction therapy. Uh, all these could be manifestations of PCOS. So when you look at the diagnostic criteria, we know that the NIH criteria has looked at mentioned irregularity and hyperandrogenism. The Rotterdam criteria looks at the presence of two out of the three and uh, with oligoinovulation, hyperandrogenism, and polycystic ovarian morphology. So they have introduced the polycystic ovarian morphology and looked at two out of the three. And uh, the AEPCOS uh, Androgen Excess Society in 2016, 2006 has uh, suggested hyperandrogenism to be a, a essential criteria with the presence of at least one or the other two uh, manifestations to be present. And all these have to be, um, uh, I mean, this diagnosis can be done when we, have, when we exclude out all the other conditions of hyperandrogenism and all other alternative causes of oligoaminuria like chronic stress, um, Ex excessive exercise, eating disorders, all these need to be excluded uh, to make a diagnosis of PCOS. So the bottom line is that consider PCOS when there's irregular menstruation, infertility, obesity, and hyperandrogenism, exclude other conditions causing similar symptoms. And if the androgen levels are very high, you need to consider and exclude adrenal or ovarian neoplasms. And make a diagnosis when more than if two or more of these conditions are present, that is oligoinovulation or uh, elevated uh, levels of circulating androgens or clinical manifestations of androgen excess and polycystic ovaries on ultrasonography. More important part of the history is the symptom onset. If symptoms begin years after puberty or have suddenly worsened, other diagnoses are more likely. So when you look at the Rotterdam criteria, you see that uh, there could be certain issues like particularly in diagnosing adolescents and they could be apparently normal women with PCO morphology on the ovaries and hypothalamic and ovulation older women is also another area where there could be confusion in terms of the diagnosis and today we have based on these uh, diagnostic criteria that we looked at we have different phenotypes of uh, PCOS you could have the classic phenotype which has all the three components, oligoamnolevation, hyperandrogenism, and uh, PCO morphology. And those are the phenotype A. Then you have a phenotype B, which is the essentially the NIH criteria, fulfilling the NIH criteria with uh, oligoamnolevation and hyperandrogenemia. You have phenotype C, which is the ovulatory phenotype, where you have the PCO morphology and hyperandrogenemia. And then you could have a phenotype D, which is essentially without much of manifestations or hyperandrogen. So these are the four different phenotypes that we see. And what we see is that the classical phenotypes, namely the phenotype A and B, have greater cardiometabolic risk as compared to the phenotype C and D. As you could see here, uh, the heterogeneous nature of PCOS is depicted on this picture where you have uh, a class significant overlap between these women and as you look at uh, these three components from hyperandrogenemia, the oligoinovulation, PCO morphology 
uh, if you have all of them together, you have the classical phenotype, then you could have the other different phenotypes. And the, the significance of this could be, uh, could, could be different. The phenotype A typically can present to the pediatrician, gynecologist, dermatologist, or the infertility specialist. They have a classic description of PCOS and often have significant signs of insulin resistance. While the phenotype B typically presents to the dermatologist or the gynecologist first, they have irregular menses or an ovulation leading to infertility, and that may be a, a major concern. Gynecologists may dismiss them as having no PCOS because uh, the PCO morphology is, is, is uh, not there in these patients, and the patient in herself is often adamant of the of the presence of the fact of uh, presence of PCOS, but the the ovarian morphology is, is typically not, not seen. If you look at uh, phenotype C, they present mainly to the dermatologist, and they often refer them to the gynecologist due to PCO morphology. If you look at the phenotype D, this is mainly picked up by the gynecologist and for this specialist because they lack the hyperandrogenism and uh, they are typically present with, with, with the fertility issues. So if you look at the prevalence of these phenotypes, I have uh, I'm, uh, uh, I mean, uh, projecting a study from uh, a recent study from, from India uh, published in the Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism, which where they have uh, shown the prevalence to be the highest prevalence to be that of the phenotype A. Uh, with 67.7% prevalence, phenotype B having 11% prevalence, and then we look at the phenotype D. Probably that's the that's that's the lowest prevalence of um, PCOS with 3.6% and 17.7 being in the ovulatory ovulatory PCOS phenotype. And if you look at their characteristics of these different phenotypes, you could see that the as we look at uh, the differences, uh, this is although this is a very busy slide, but I just highlight some of the features which are different in this probably the the, the BMI and uh, the androgen levels and the insulin resistance is higher in the phenotype A as and as it decreases as you go on to from phenotype A to phenotype D and if you look at the responsiveness to clomiphin also uh, the, the the phenotype A probably has uh, the greatest uh, resistance to clomiphin and uh, the responsiveness is lower in this phenotype. Now, if we look at the weight and metabolic parameters, various studies have shown that phenotype A tends to have higher weight than phenotype C and D. Phenotype B have has a weight in between them, and uh, the fasting insulin and HOMA IR are, are more in phenotype A as compared to the phenotypes B and D. The lipid profiles are more deranged in the phenotype A with higher LDL and total cholesterol and lower LDL HDL values. And when you look at the hyperandrogenism, the FG scores are in testosterone and androstenedine levels. They are significantly higher in phenotype A and as compared to phenotype C and D. And B is intermediate between these two categories. The menstrual irregularity is also higher in A than in B and D. And if you look at the ovarian reserve parameters, the AMH levels are lower in type A. Clomiphene resistance is significantly higher in the full-blown PCOS phenotype A as compared to phenotype D. So results from many other studies across the world have also shown uh, similar findings. And least but not uh, last but not least, we could say that women with hyperandrogenic PCOS have a worse cardiometabolic profile and have higher prevalence of cardiovascular risk factors compared to women with non-hyperandrogenic PCOS. So I would conclude by saying that presentation of PCOS is not homogeneous. It depends on the presence or absence of these three uh, parameters that we're looking at, hyperandrogenism, insulin irregularities, and PCO morphology. Different phenotypes present differently concerning their clinical, metabolic, and hormonal profile, which alters their response uh, to ovulation induction, inducing agents like clomiphene. And uh, phenotype A, which is the most prevalent, has the highest uh, degree of hyperandrogenism, obesity, and cardiovascular risk. And on the contrary, phenotype D is the least severe or the mildest presentation of PCOS. And these differences suggest that each phenotype of PCOS is a variation of the common syndrome. I thank you all for the patient hearing. And I bring to you greetings from the city of Hyderabad, where you see this famous statue of Buddha. 
in the Hussein Sagar Thank you.